Well, hello world. <laughs> so last year on the LibreOffice conference in Denmark, I had a lightning talk. So um, I had exactly two minutes to uh, present my subversive feminist agenda. And in the beginning of the lightning talk, I asked everyone, I prepared some small physical exercise for the people who were present. And I asked everyone who Id identifies himself as a white male to stand up. And what do you think happened? Well, everybody, but for one person in the room stood up. And then one, that one person didn't stand up just because he happened to be Asian. And when this talk was over, uh, Lior Kaplan, our contributor from Israel, came to me and said, you know what? I think you should, you should make this a mainline talk. And I said, mm, I don't think so. It would, it would, I, I would have nothing, like this lightning talk was just enough, and I would have nothing to talk about in the mainline talk. So I don't think it's such a brilliant idea. But then some amazing things started happening in the LibreOffice community. And the first of them, the first of them was that Gul Shakoshe, our amazing developer from Turkey, convinced all her girlfriends to start contributing to LibreOffice. And this is how Turkish de LibreOffice developer community looks like. And then our, our amazing TDF members appointed a chairwoman of the board. There she is. I think she sits somewhere here. <laughs> and, and the next day I took to IRC and I was like, Wow, this is, this is awesome. The TDF members are feminists. They appointed the chairwoman of the board. And then our amazing marketing team came and made this amazing blog post for the International Women's Day, kind of uh, highlight, highlighting all the female TDF members and their achievements and actually encouraging more women to, to apply for TDF membership and to have their contribution somehow recognized. So I thought now time has come to really make this a main light talk and that's why I'm here and let's see if I will have something to talk about for the whole 20 minutes. So what's this gonna be about? So first we're gonna have a look at some boring numbers. How do we stand, how do we compare to the other communities where where do women in the office are? Uh, what's the percentage, what they're doing? Then we will, uh, I will try to somehow ask the question, why does this all really matter? Like, why should we care? Why is the gender diversity such a good thing? And then we will have a look at some, some common problems that, that women face in the free software development. Some of those are like those, those problems kind of overlap like with women in science, women in technology, and whatnot, and they are by no means specific to LibreOffice, but I will try to somehow show some solutions or some suggested approaches like we in PEC, because, because we can't go and fix the world, but we can make definitely some things in our community happen that can improve the, the dire state of the things. So the numbers, and those, those numbers are kind of, uh, as, I, as I realized, that, that's kind of hard to get. Because like for the, for, the, for the TDF membership, yes, we do track the gender of the person who applies for the membership. But the Git, for example, doesn't have any gender button, like, because the Git doesn't care what gender you are. And it's even, more, it's even worse with the contributors who, who change the wiki because they use nicknames. So at least with the Git commits, you can have a look at the name. And if somebody's name is Michael or Philip, then you probably know that this is not a woman. So you can somehow guess like what, what, the, what the numbers are there, but, but like no way you can, you can guess the nick of a person who, who contributes to wiki under their gender. So yes, so how, how does it look like? According to Floss survey, uh, that surveyed like some, some large amount of free and open source software communities. 
uh, there's some 11% of women contributing to free and open source software. It's actually the number went quite up because when they did the same survey in 2006, it was just one and a half percent. And then the chart, the other chart, that's uh, I I was I wasn't sure like what to do because like it would be best like to, to have the comparison if if the data came from the same source, but they don't. It was just impossible to to find some same or the related sources like to to track the involvement of women in closed source and open source software. So that's some, those are some US data from the National Center for Women in Technology in the United States. And uh, there the percentage of, of employees who work for tech companies is up to 27% of women. Uh, however, I have some reservations towards this data because if you, if you ask a high tech company to, to report the number of the female staff, what are they going to do? They're going to include all the, I don't know, human resources and receptionists and secretaries and whatnot. It's, it's hardly ever like the number they report. It's hardly ever limited to their, to their stuff that is actually technical. And the next that I have is that I, I took the LibreOffice core repository and actually, actually look at the numbers there. At some points, it was pretty funny because I, I, I was not sure about some, some ethnic names, not from European space, so I had to ask some, my, my Indian GSOC student, is this a male name, is this a female name, what about this name? And so there was like, as, as of yesterday, there's been some mm, bit more of a thousand of people who ever committed code to LibreOffice, uh, 1049 to be exact, and out of three, I was able to identify 33 as a woman. So it's some 3% some of total. And finally, the TDF members. Uh, last year, we had 200, 210 members, out of which 20 were women. This year, uh, that's the chart over there. Uh, the numbers went a bit down because some people did not extend the membership. So both numbers of, of all members as well as number of, of women. So now it's on something between 7 and 8 percent of TDF members are actually women. And now the important question. Why is this so important? Why should we care? Why should we do anything to, to increase the number of or to increase the gender diversity in our community well uh, study after study somehow proves that the more diverse team the better it works it leads to better decision making like taking different inputs from different sources and the need to compromise and also to, to more, more innovation and more creativity and somehow the resulting product is if it matches, like if, the, if the, the team that develops a product is diverse, it's very likely that the resulting product will match the different needs of, of different groups. And, and the, such product somehow then attracts the wider pool of, well, in commercial software, wider pool of clients. Open source software, it can attract wider pool of contributors and the users. Because if I, if I see that people who work on particular, particular product, particular software, I look at them and I see, oh, those are people like me. So perhaps when they were working on, on their product, like developing the software I am going to use, if I see the members of my group represented among the developers and the contributors, it is likely they, they made a product that will match my needs. Uh, and last but not least, oh, exclude, like women make some 50% of population, which is, a, which is a huge talent pool. So it would be just nonsense to somehow exclude this group from active participation or not to do more to, to or like put it differently, 
not to do more, not to strive to, to include this wide pool of talent. And of course, like the, the diverse, diverse uh, set of colleagues, co-workers, people I interact with, somehow creates a work better, better atmosphere in the workplace. <laughs> but so uh, we've seen the numbers, and we now saw the reasons. Like why, why should we somehow how sh how we should benefit from the diversity? And now the questions we should uh, ask ourselves: Is this is this really so that the the women are act like somehow disinterested? They just don't contribute because they don't want to, or they have different interests, or is there is there something that's holding them back? Why why are they left behind? I'm I will try to outline some some problems and perhaps suggest some solutions to a couple of them. Problem number one is something I call the confidence gap which is, in general, women tend to have much lower self-confidence in comparison with men. And this is particularly true in the technical fields, in the science, technology, engineering, and math. This is what the STEM, STEM acronym stands for. Um, sometimes I wonder if there's some, some gene for confidence that sits on a Y chromosome only. But I think it's something, like, I don't think so, and it must be something else. And one part of the problem is that in our culture, computers or anything technical, it's heavily marketed, marketing of that is heavily targeted at men. If you, if you pay attention in the history class, you perhaps know that the first computers, the operators of the first computers, were women. And if, if you look at some numbers, you see that like, the involvement of women of, of, uh, in computer science actually goes down over the time. And of course, everybody, everybody knows the, the rear admiral, Mrs. Grace Hopper, which invented the term bug and debugging. So in the past, uh, computers, it was, it was not considered to be man's job to work with the computers. This has heavily changed in the end of 70s, beginning of 80s, when the computers like, heavily started to be marketed and targeted at men. And as a result, if, you, if you're a parent, it perhaps doesn't even occur to you if you have a daughter that you could perhaps buy her a computer or somehow motivate her to play with the computer, unlike if you, if you have a son. And this is then somehow somehow enforced. <laughs> I, I've heard all all of those statements. I didn't make any any one of them up. I heard all of them myself. And it's then somehow enforced later at school that the assumptions of the teachers and of the educators are that that girls have somehow less aptitude in technology and in computers, and they, they need to be explained things twice to get them and yeah well this code is so bad it must have been written by a woman and and then well I don't know I the, the last statement I came to some trade fair to speak at the the software I was developing and after after that talk a, a customer came to me and asked me if I was really a software engineer because he, he just considered me he looked at me and he said you're too pretty to be software engineer And a consequence of all this is that if there is some, some technology job, women, due to lower self-confidence and due to being told that no way the computers are for them and no way they can be any good at this, is that even if there are jobs and internships offered, they don't apply. And the same holds true for, for, the, for the open source software. They don't co contribute because they believe their contributions simply wouldn't be good enough. I can, like some personal experience, I had a, there was a female GSOC student this year, and I was mentoring her earlier for, for a school project, and after the school project was over, I asked her, why don't you, why don't you, what, what about you go and try, try GSOC, try applying for the GSOC? And she said, mm, 
I don't think I know enough to do that. I don't think I would be able to do that. And for three months, she has been contributing code to LibreOffice, patch after patch. The code was actually of pretty good quality. So something she has been doing for three months, and she still do, did not believe that she can actually do this. Is there so some things we can do about this confidence gap? There is a thing run by, um, I think, Software Freedom Conservancy, previously GNOME Foundation. It's a special outreach program targeted at women. So it works um, pretty similar fashion than GSOC. The, so the women take some internship. I think it takes them some three or four months where they actually work on some open source project and get paid for their contributions. They are assigned a mentor who somehow yeah, well, guides their way through the project. Um, only, only women and transgender people are eligible to apply to this project. Uh, this, is, this can be somehow, I can see how this can be encouraging that some, some women can feel safer in this environment because they don't feel like they're competing against men and somehow don't feel inferior or like when they think like, oh, those guys, like they know much more than I and I can't really compare. Another important feature, like something we can do, is somehow to, to make the female role models within the community visible and to actually have some pool of female mentors available. And so, and for the, for the, for the events and for the hackfests and for the conferences, if I, if I look at the speakers list for the, I don't know how many past LibreOffice conferences, it used to be like all male roster. Like they are simply like, there were simply no women or just one woman or something like this. And if the conference organizers complain and they say, oh, well, we would like to have some female speakers, but they just don't go and don't apply. It's, it's important to be aware of this confidence gap. And I can, I can say that from my, tell that from my own experience that I simply thought like, okay, I, I will, I could perhaps talk at FOSTEM or somewhere, but I don't think I have much to say, so I didn't apply. And then I went to FOSTEM and I went to somebody else's talk and I thought, oh, I could, I could, I could talk about these things and even, even much more. And the guy who had, to, who had the talk had the confidence and he actually uh, sent in the paper and I didn't because I, I thought like I can't, can't do that. And I think it's important that the people who organize conferences and the, the hacker events are actually aware of this and they actively seek out the female speakers and the female contributors and actually invite them to speak at the conferences. And once we got over the confidence gap, there is something called second shift. I chose this picture of, of Rosie, the riveter, because like um, during the Second World War, um, the women massively entered the workforce. So they were getting paid for their jobs, but somehow relieving them of their other duties, especially like domestic chores and uh, child care or caretaking responsibilities wasn't somehow part of the deal. So, and I was born here in Czechoslovakia and it was like that during the communism, everybody had to be, every adult person had to be employed full time it wasn't said that everybody also has to work, but they had to be employed. And, <laughs> and when the women came go home from their first shift at job, the second shift started because they had to do the shopping and take care of the kids, cook the dinner, clean up, do the ironing and so on. While, well, the men's time after work, it belongs to them. They're free to do whatever they want with their time and um, this is frequently no longer the case, but I have to say, like, it's, it's changing, but, but rather slowly, and in some cultures, this is not changing at all. It's, it's still the same way. Anybody ever heard of leaky pipeline? So this is some kind of nice chart 
Um, it's about women in science, but I think we can, we can apply, we can extend this argument to, well, for example, computer science. So once we somehow stuff enough women into the pipeline, somehow entering technology or mathematics or computer science field, something strange starts to happen after a while, especially after like the women get married, they leave the field. They just don't stay. That, that's why it's called leaky pipeline. While, while the men somehow proceed to the pipeline, the women slowly over the time start to drop out. And this is, this is what's happening to, to older women, married women, with the families in open source as well. As I say, like they... <laughs> and, and, and it's especially true in, in, in free and open source because, because this is usually something you do in your free time. And as I said, like the man's free time belongs to him, uh, while a woman's free time is frequently filled with various different responsibilities. And if you don't believe me, just think about how, how many women have you seen, for example, in the local tennis club or a golf club, so that I don't mention some, some heavily masculine activities. And part of the problem is that events like this, conferences or hackfests, are very unfriendly to people that have actually families. So, well, I, I came to the, to the organizers of the LibreOffice conference in Denmark last year. I introduced myself and I said, like, this is, this is my son. And you guys happen to have any childcare here? And I got a blank stare. And the organizer apologized and he said, oh, we didn't think about that. Of course, they don't think about it because people usually don't bring their children to the hacker events. But... And it's not like, I mean, people yeah, like... <laughs> I, I get to that. <laughs> and it's, it's, not only, it's not only about women, it's also about the men. So how to, how to deal with this? One, uh, like the, the women somehow not having enough of free time to dedicate to open source. So an obvious solution is to provide some jobs involving free and open source to women. So it's not their third shift up to the first shift in the job and second shift at home, something that have barely any time to do, but it's actually their first shift. It will be their day job. This is very effective way how to get more women into open source. And again, to overcome the confidence gap, it is, it is important not to wait until the women apply because due to confidence gap, they often don't, but to actively reach out for them. And this, this statement, I quoted verbatim from, from the website advertising the jobs for the certain famous uh, free and open source software company. Is anyone's guess which company might that be? <laughs> so I'm, it, it's not legal to say that. No. Fair enough. Yes, you see, they're admitting they're aware of, of the sad state of affairs in the technology sector, and they're going to prefer, provided the two, two <coughs> equally qualified applicants, they're going to prefer the female one. And it's, it's called up systems. So now you can send the lawyers after them. And I also wanted to highlight the, the events that actually became family friendly that actually offers some extended and some very, very nice childcare. One of them is Depconf, uh, Guadec and, and Froscon that even offered some, some Lego Mindstorms games for the, for the bigger kids. And the third part of the problem, I, I'm not going to discuss this in the great length because I don't have that much time. Some things that tend to happen in majority male environment and that like if the majority somehow doesn't realize that those things are somehow off-putting to the minority members, they will keep happening. 
I, so I'm, I, I've been a GSOC mentor for, for a couple of years by now, so especially in the, in the community application period, I frequently interact with the students. And this year, a very curious thing happened to me. There was a student applying for my particular project. I was chatting with him. And then I thought, wait, is this guy flirting with me? And that was indeed the case. And I'm an old lady, so I'm, I'm able to shrug it off or to laugh it off. But then I imagine 25 years old myself in, that shoes, in those shoes. And I was not laughing so much anymore. Then I imagine some other woman in my place that would be from some different culture where some barriers or relationship between genders are much less liberal than here in Europe. And I was not laughing at all. And I was asking myself a question, how, how prepared are we to deal with events like this? And I had to answer, I don't know. So, well, a couple of other issues in this area, like that's, that's the invisibility that well, people can say because, like, simply the women are in such minority that, like, sim people might tend to think that there are no women contributing to liberal office. Some unvent unwanted attention, so the female contributor somehow attracts attention just because she's female. And then some, I observed that in the liberal office community, but, like, everywhere as well, the women are somehow indirectly channeled into the positions that are somehow non-technical. People tend to think, oh, women tend to, they are not interested in contributing code. They might do marketing or LTNN. And as a result, or it's the other way around, I don't know, uh, those are somehow, so the code contributors are some sort of aristocracy. They somehow rule the project and make the important decisions and non-code contributors are somehow considered to be second-class citizens. It correlates, I, I, I'm not saying this, this like there's some cause and effect, there's a strong correlation between like those type of contributions that are con so considered somehow to be second-class and with how many women actually do them. And sadly I have no solutions to those issues, but if you're interested in, in an hour, uh, well, after, after Jonas talk, after mine, you can come to this very room and we will have a workshop about the diversity and how to make our community more inclusive. And that's all from my side. And I have some, unfortunately, only two minutes for the questions.